Hello, welcome to the new edition of Turkey Talks. Today with Kadir Üstün uh, from DC, uh, Washington DC, we will be talking about whether there is a new page uh, being opened between Turkish and uh, American relations. Uh, President uh, Erdogan and President Biden met at the margins of the uh, G20 uh, meeting at uh, Rome uh, last week. And uh, the outcome seems to be quite positive, at least from uh, Turkey's uh, perspective. Kadir, uh, you have seen the statements by both sides. Do you think that this will be the beginning of a new page between Turkey and the uh, US, given the uh, existing problems? Uh, I believe so, and I hope so, because um, there was a concrete uh, announcement out of the uh, meeting. Um, the leader said that they were going to establish a new uh, dialogue mechanism between uh, probably high-level officials uh, between the principals. And that's something uh, needed very much in the U.S.-Turkey relationship. As you know, Turkey, when there was a crisis over the S-400 issue between Turkey and the U.S., uh, Turkey had recommended, suggested that a technical group would be established and then both sides, uh, especially the Defense Department and uh, Turkish Defense Ministry would come together and figure out how to make sure S-400s wouldn't threaten uh, the NATO alliance, obviously, uh, which Turkey is a part of, and then of uh, any kind of uh, threat against uh, F-35s. But uh, back then, the Defense Department, Pentagon, uh, didn't think that was a great idea. And then there were many other uh, political uh, issues related to this. Uh, that never happened. So that was supposed to be a technical group to resolve the S-400 issue. Uh, that's not happening uh, right now, but the uh, announcement out of uh, Rome uh, after biden Erdogan meeting uh, seems to suggest that it should be a broader uh, group uh, with a broader agenda, uh, basically addressing all the hot button issues in the US-Turkey relationship from FETA to YPG to um, S-400s, F-35s, and the recent proposal uh, to purchase F-16s by, by Turkey. So um, I'm somewhat more hopeful because this was needed. We've, we've been saying this for years. There needs to be established dialogue mechanisms. Uh, it's not clear, of course, who is going to be in that mechanism and how far down it's going to be uh, going down to be supported from below. Uh, principals talk to each other when usually there are crises, but uh, if this mechanism works on an ongoing uh, manner uh, with a fixed schedule with their own sort of support groups underneath, uh, that would be very helpful. I mean, all the indications are that, you know, defense uh, people, intelligence people, national security advisors, uh, they should be, they would be involved. Uh, but we'll see well, how that exact mechanism going to work. But I think it is an important step in, in repairing the U.S.-Turkey relationship, making sure that it doesn't, you know, um, when there are crises, which we often see in this um, very volatile region, volatile global order, uh, those um, challenges and those issues are addressed quickly. All right, I think that's a good introduction about the framework uh, and there are some other issues that maybe we need to discuss. I think one important issue to me, as you have said, the establishment of a new mechanism. And uh, as far as reports uh, suggest in Turkey, this will be a high level uh, mechanism, which will also involve uh, ministers actually uh, at the ministerial level. I think that is a uh, a step further than the previous, uh, you know, let's say negotiations, I would say. Yes, advisors are important, of course, uh, maybe, uh, but also in this case, we see that decision makers will be involved in the uh, process. And there are, as you have said, some outstanding issues between the countries, but I think uh, Turkey has also, I think, made some very positive statements about the uh, outcome of the meeting between Biden and uh, Erdogan. 
But uh, there are also some, I think, issues when we look at the uh, press conference right after the meeting. Uh, President Erdogan, for example, talked about, again, the U.S. support to um, uh, PYD and YPG. Uh, there were other things. He's also said that the meeting was very friendly. It was very positive. But it seems that there are some uh, issues that uh, needs to be maybe worked uh, more and more. Uh, how this picture is seen uh, from Washington, D.C.? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I ju as you underlined, diplomacy is very important, and many um, in the in the recent years, channels of diplomacy had uh, broken down uh, in many instances during the Trump administration, even prior to that, during the Obama administration, when these crises crises appeared, uh, it was more like a crisis response mode rather than an ongoing dialogue to prevent such crises and create a uh, strategic framework. So uh, that is important, as you mentioned. Um, but when it comes to, of course, problem areas, we can talk more in detail uh, about this. Uh, the YPG issue, uh, I've written in the past that, you know, that remains uh, a major spoiler and major uh, issue between the U.S. and uh, Turkey um, because, you know, YPG is Syrian extension of the PKK and it, PKK never uh, disarmed against Turkey. There was a peace process that uh, was not successful, um, largely because the PKK saw, saw other opportunities in the region and it wanted to create something uh, in northern Syria. Uh, so the PKK is an ongoing national security threat to Turkey's security. So when the U.S. policymakers made a distinction between the PKK and YPG, uh, nobody bought it and nobody, including U.S. officials themselves, bought it. Uh, but, you know, against ISIS, there was a uh, policy to not have U.S. boots on the ground and they used PKK forces on the ground against ISIS. And this is an ongoing uh, concern to Turkey. Turkey intervened in several instances into Syria. It is now controlling several areas, both to protect itself from further refugee uh, inflows, but also uh, to make sure that PKK doesn't control the Turkish border with Syria. So. I am not surprised that President Erdogan brought that up again. He will all he keeps bringing it up and sometimes people say that, you know, oh, it's election season. He needs to bring this up. But we've seen it's not election season in Turkey right now. Turkey brings up this issue over and over again because it is a, a direct national security threat along its border and PKK uh, has been an ongoing threat for 40 years, as you know. Um, so I don't think Turkey is going to drop that issue at all. It is. It continues to be deeply uncomfortable with the U.S. support to the YPG. And I think that this will be one of the top agenda items in this uh, new mechanism when they meet, when they get together. Uh, I think it has the potential to basically trump all the other issues uh, and and complicate the relationship further. Perhaps uh, you can uh, uh, talk about that because I know that, you know, for Turks, uh, many the public opinion uh, has been uh, deeply influential in Turkish foreign policy making. It directly impacts people and they in their eyes, America supports PKK, you know, so like maybe you can talk about that feeling inside Turkey among the people you you were on the ground as a parliamentarian. I'm sure you heard that so many times. Well, actually, if you look at the Turkish public opinion and how it has changed over the years with regard to U.S. in Turkey, uh, I think it uh, gradually went down from top to now uh, bottom simply because um, uh, Turkish public opinion, Turkish people, Turkish uh, decision makers, politicians, yeah, almost everyone in Turkey, I think there is almost a consensus on this issue. As we have uh, discussed here, there is almost no issue that uh, Turkish public opinion can have a, a consensual view or the politi political parties. 
But uh, on this front, I think there is a united voice in Turkey. Although Turks argue that uh, you know both uh, states are uh, members of NATO, uh, what uh, US uh, has been doing with regard to its support to uh, PYD and YPG in the region is not in the spirit of uh, cooperation and solidarity between the two allies. You would remember that Biden in his statement after the uh, meeting in Rome, he also said that Turkey is a NATO member. And uh, if Turkey is a NATO member, if uh, US is the NATO member, then I think uh, it is expected that, I think it's a natural expectation from everyone, they would respect their concerns. And Turkey has a serious uh, national security concern with regard to its uh, uh, southern borders with uh, Syria and as well as uh, Iraq, uh, as you know. And uh, it is also, uh, I think, well known that the PYD and YPG, uh, they are trying to have a terrorist corridor in the region. Uh, and I think uh, any um, reasonable person uh, would say that uh, this is not acceptable to Turkey. Uh, and Turkey expects that US can uh, also understand, US can at least have some empathy uh, for Turkey because US also suffered from terrorist activities, but not as uh, long as Turkey. So Turkey has been uh, fighting and combating terrorism since the beginning of 1980s and it uh, became now uh, when we had other terrorist organization in the region and some nine state actors, whether they are uh, recognized as terrorist organizations or not. So we know that there are some armed groups in the region and Turkey also sees them as a threat. Therefore, uh, I think it is very difficult to convince Turkish public opinion and Turkish public that the US uh, really is uh, in a position of understanding Turkey's concern. Uh, but Turks also argue that uh, if Turkey is member of the NATO, then NATO's border is Turkey's border and Turkey's border is a NATO border. Uh, and in the southern flank of the uh, NATO, uh, Turkey stands. Uh, therefore, uh, it is uh, uh, quite surprising to us actually that uh, U.S. still, uh, despite all these sort of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, opposition from the Turkish side, still on the ground supports uh, PYD and YPG. And as you would also remember, Kadir, uh, Turks uh, and the Turkey uh, wanted to work with U.S. Uh, on the ground to combat uh, ISIS and Daesh. Mm -hmm. uh, Turkey also joined uh, the uh, group that was uh, fighting uh, Daesh and uh, made available all its resources on the ground, including uh, uh, provision of uh, intelligence to the Western allies. And Turkey has, I think, done its uh, responsibilities in order to, uh, you know, clean this area uh, from the uh, non-state actors and terrorist organizations so that uh, some humanitarian uh, issues could be prioritized. The peace issue uh, may be political solution to the crisis uh, in Syria. And so this is an issue. Now, let me ask you a question, because this is being discussed in Turkey almost on every TV channel and every uh, you know uh, academic meeting uh, and also in political debates. Uh, now, the Katsa issue. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know that because uh, Turkey's S-400 uh, uh, purchase from uh, Russia, uh, U.S. Uh, imposed Katsa. Maybe it is a mild one at the moment, but uh, uh, it may go further. But meanwhile, there is a debate that India uh, is buying S-400, but uh, U.S. will exempt India from mm -hmm. Katsa uh, uh, sanctions. And uh, in Turkey, people cannot understand it. I mean, why U.S. is uh, giving the impression that uh, it has double standards when it comes to a NATO ally, there is CASA, uh, but when it comes to non-NATO country, uh, there is no uh, sanctions of this kind. And also, of course, I would remind you, maybe uh, not everybody knows that, uh, Greece has also uh, bought and purchased S-400, S, S, uh, I think 300 from 300. 300, and there has been no sanctions, neither by NATO nor by US. How this is justified by the US administration? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so first, maybe Indians should thank Turks because Turkey fought this battle and now uh, the U.S. policymakers are realizing that maybe they can't really dictate other nations to uh, kind of purchase which uh, weapon systems, etc. Um, joking aside, though, um, for 
for the S400 issue, uh, there was an additional, there were several additional uh, complications in the Turkish case. One, you know, the Turkey was still in the F-35 program, and then Pentagon uh, it, planners have been thinking that F-35 is going to basically dominate the next several decades, uh, uh, you know, just like how F-16s had dominated decades of uh, air power, uh, the balance of power uh, in the air, um, now F-35 is the next generation, and they felt that S-400s uh, would endanger the F-35 program, and uh, that's why there was a big uh, reaction. And then, of course, there wasn't a consistent uh, sort of um, explanation, set of explanations given to Turkey, right? Turkey said, look, if you think that's going to do that, Let's sit down and study the technical aspects of this and make sure that it doesn't threaten F-35 systems. Uh, we are a NATO country. We are part of this program. Of course, we don't want it to be endangered because that's going to be our next generation of fighters ourselves. So why would we want that system to be weakened? Uh, of course, Pentagon said no. And uh, there was a NATO income compatibility argument for a while from Washington. Hey, you can't integrate it with the NATO systems. And Turkey said, OK, I will not try to uh, incorporate it, uh, integrate it with NATO systems anyway. Then, you know, if you remember, NATO general secretary was, uh, was uh, less uh, sort of more amenable to Turkish position in the sense that every nation has their own sovereign right to purchase whatever defense systems systems they want. Um, so there was a kind of a disconnect, I would say, between Washington and NATO, NATO headquarters on that uh, question as well. And then, of course, there was a concern about potential future buyers like India and, other, you know, even some Gulf nations were interested in S-400s because Obviously, Russia is trying to make, you know, is is trying to sell advanced systems to various countries around the world because that it relies on that income as well. It's an important competition with the with the U.S. and China and others uh, for for Russia as well. So they make those deals as sweet as possible from their perspective, uh, and Washington didn't want. Uh, for potential buyers in the future, and they wanted kind of a, to make an example out of Turkey in many ways to make sure, you know, nobody dares buy S-400s. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to India now, there's a talk. Uh, I'm sure India lobbied about this, but uh, there is now a talk to make an exception for India because, you know, the administration's new China policy requires that India uh, be on the side of the United States in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. So for national security uh, sort of requirements and, and as part of this new policy that the administration wants to pursue, they seem to be, we haven't heard anything from the administration, if I'm not wrong, uh, so it may be an early judgment, but uh, Washington may want to kind of uh, uh, allow India to have its own uh, S-400s uh, as long as it's going to cooperate with the U.S. against China. But I'm I'm doubtful about you know India's ability to confront China. It's a big power. It's an important power, but India probably won't want to line up 100% uh, along along the U.S. against a regional power like China. So, um, but that's, those are kind of couple things that make this uh, quote unquote uh, double standard against Turkey. We, uh, unfortunately, we, we talk about these double standards all the time. Uh, and yes, there are exceptions to Turkish case. Turkey is a NATO country and it wants to cooperate with its NATO, uh, you know, allies and purchase arms, advanced arms from its Western allies. But uh, it also wants to 
reassert, it wants to assert its right to purchase whatever defense, uh, you know, um, systems from whatever country. Um, and, you know, as you said very recently last week, uh, it was uh, debated uh, a lot in Turkey. That how come India now gets an exception, uh, whereas Turkey uh, has sanctions on them? Of course, those sanctions are quite limited. Uh, hopefully, this new mechanism that's going to be established, uh, strategic dialogue mechanism between the two countries, can arrive at a common understanding about the removal of those sanctions eventually. Uh, so, um, I mean, you're right. I mean, it, it, there's no denying that this exception to India uh, would again raise eyebrows in Turkey um, and it's not good for the US-Turkey relationship. Right, I think, thank you very much. I think that's that's a good frame and also uh, you have uh, well explained the reasons behind U.S. let's say uh, position towards uh, India that is quite different uh, than from Turkey. There is yet another issue. One another issue, Kadir. We need to talk about this in in the context of defense relationship between Turkey and uh, uh, U.S. I think uh, from Turkey's perspective, when I talk to many people uh, on the ground here, uh, U.S. sends actually uh, U.S. sent uh, contradictory. Uh, messages to the Turkish uh, public opinion, at least as far as Turkish public is concerned. Why? Because when I look at the statements uh, you know, coming from the White House, uh, Biden, sometimes some congressmen, uh, you know, there is no, I think, um, uh, unified uh, voice or a unified position with regard to U.S. foreign policy in general and its policy towards uh, Turkey in, in particular. On the uh, issue of uh, F-16, for example, uh, in the beginning, it was thought that it would be an easy, let's say, buy from U.S. because the proposal uh, came from U.S. as far as uh, uh, we, we understand. And Turkey applied for uh, buying new F-16s and also modernized uh, quite a few of them. Um, but when we uh, look at what happened in Rome, uh, Biden said, yes, I support this uh, purchase from, uh, from U.S. But the Congress is there, so he says he will put his, uh, you know, let's say, he puts maybe pressure on the Congress. But yeah. uh, so it does not really a convincing uh, or strong message to Turkey that Turkey will receive F-16 rather than putting Congress in between. Uh, so this is something also I think uh, U.S. administration needs to make clear its position. Of course, we understand. I mean, Turks understand that the. Uh, each and every nation state or country will have uh, uh, their own priority uh, and uh, national interest. But I think when we talk about the bilateral relationship, there must be some sort of balancing act. Uh, I mean, as uh, you reminded us that after 9-11, U.S. Uh, administration said you are either with us or with our enemy. I mean, this is black and white uh, policy. It is uh, something yeah. that cannot be accepted by the, uh, you know, by, by the partners. If Turkey and U.S. are partners, which we see as partners and allies as well, I think this is something that uh, that is troubling for the Turkish uh, public opinion and for the Turkish people. Uh, how do you explain these contradictory messages? Is that the nature of American uh, uh, policy or is that something that is also, uh, again, a, a specific uh, uh, policy towards Turkey? Kadir? Well, uh, this kind of uh, lack of unified uh, voice is a is a complaint by many nations, uh, right? They get mixed signals. Uh, they get even they feel like they are deceived, uh, like in the case of France recently. Uh, and Biden apologized to to um, you know Macron about that. Biden also apologized to the fact that U.S. had pulled out of the climate uh, deal. Paris Agreement um, uh, during the Trump administration. So um, we see pendulum swinging uh, this way or that in Washington, and that's kind of the nature of American poli uh, foreign policy in many ways. There are different centers of power. We are aware of that, those structural issues. Uh, you know, Congress becomes more active in foreign policy. Uh, during the Trump administration, uh, they were actually very concerned about Trump's relationship with Russia. That's why they passed that 
uh, legislation called CATSA. Uh, CATSA is supposed to deal with uh, Russia, right? The 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 um, adversaries of the United States, uh, and it was imposed on Turkey because Turkey bought as four hundreds, but it wasn't supposed to originally punish other nations. It was supposed to uh, punish Russia and uh, kind of contain uh, Russia's influence. So, and that was done against Trump and uh, Trump was seen close to Turkey, although, you know, Trump actually imposed sanctions on Turkey uh, to, in two instances. One was uh, over uh, with, a, with a tweet actually, um, and then later on S-400 uh, sanctions, CASA sanctions on S-400s. Uh, so this lack of unity in policy is endemic in Washington DC by the White House. And when they bring this to Congress, what they need to argue is, look, this is about a NATO ally maintaining its capabilities, existing capabilities, which make NATO strong. This is the second largest army in in NATO, uh, they need to be strong so that NATO alliance is strong. Yes, they've bought S-400s, but let's not make this about the S-400s. They're not asking for F-35s, which, you know, uh, they can't uh, get F-35s right now. Um, so they can't endanger uh, F-16 program. It's not like, you know, their S-400s will be a potentially a danger to to F-16s or the or NATO. Uh, on the contrary, if we sell them as F-16s and they get to maintain their existing fleet uh, and repair it and uh, make sure it's is solid, uh, they they will be a strong NATO ally, and we need them uh, in uh, in so many regions, right? Uh, in the Middle East, in North Africa, in Libya, uh, in in Eastern Europe. So the the way that White House needs to present this to Congress is going to be important. And I think they're largely aware of this. But of course, some uh, senators uh, who are known to be to have very strong anti-Turkey views, uh, they have the Trump card in their hand, they can put a hold on these, all, on any kind of uh, ad weapon systems transfers to Turkey. They have that power. They've done that in the past. Uh, they've done that in uh, over the F-35s. Uh, so it's going to be up to White House, to the administration, to convince those uh, senators not to do that and allow this sale to go through. Of course, if there's a situation, you know, Biden did uh, mention S-400s as a major concern for Washington. If Biden comes back to Turkey and says, OK, you know, to be able to purchase these F-16s, uh, you need to give up on the S-400s. I'm sure Turkey's response will be like, what does that have anything to do with the F-16s? Explain to me why. <laughs> these two are related other than politics. So Biden at that point would would have to tell Turkey basically that he couldn't convince Congress and he doesn't have that kind of uh, power or convincing arguments over Congress. And that would be a shame, I think, uh, for the US-Turkey relationship because traditionally, as you know, White House has been uh, sort of in charge it is technically in charge of foreign policy and it is able to make these uh, major decisions about national security. But uh, if it loses to kind of congressional activism on this, it wouldn't be a good development for US-Turkey relationship. Uh, and perhaps you can also talk about potential reaction by Turkey on that one. Uh, Kadir, we have been talking about how Turkey perceives the threats around Turkey, especially on the border. And I think, uh, as you have put it rightly before, these are existential threats. And any nation state, any country which uh, have these sort of uh, threat perceptions, I think they will do their best to have uh, uh, advanced uh, defense systems, including missiles. 
And Turkey uh, tried to get it from uh, US and from its NATO allies. Uh, but uh, I think this process uh, did not produce anything uh, tangible, anything. Uh, therefore, Turkey had to go to other uh, sources. Uh, there were, I think, short negotiations with China at the time, but later on, I think a broader understanding uh, emerged between uh, Russia and Turkey. And that happened gradually. Turkey's mm. decision to buy S-400 was not something that happened overnight. It was not out of the blue. I think everybody knew that, uh, and uh, maybe behind the curtains, there was there was some sort of maybe uh, informing the uh, different audience at, at that stage. But it seems that the uh, US uh, did not really care what Turkey was saying. Uh, but I think what we see in recent, at least in the last five to six years, uh, Turkey's defense industry developed. Yes, S-400 is something that Turkey uh, it was the second choice, as you would remember. The, the Patriots uh, were the first choice and first option for Turkey, but Turkey had to go to the uh, other side. And I think we have, uh, Turkey has said this maybe a hundred times, but I think it falls onto the deaf ears on, on the US side. I mean, but Turkey had its own uh, national security threats like US. When, when US is dealing with China, you know, a thousand uh, uh, kilometers away, miles away, or in the Middle East, I think this is a very uh, convincing very strong argument when you say uh, existential threat to the national security. Uh, mm -hmm. And Turkish national security is as important as the US national security from uh, Turkey's perspective, not less. Therefore, Turkey, I think, will do everything. If F-16s are denied to Turkey, I think this will be yet another blow to the Turkish-US relations and the image of US will be uh, much more damaged because as we understand today, there has been a sort of uh, not 100% promise but, you know, we have seen some sort of political will behind repairing the relationship. And I think Turkey expressed it very clearly. And also U.S. has done so. And we would like to, I think Turkey would like to see that will is still there. And uh, Biden will not, uh, you know, uh, give up. I mean, uh, because he is the president and he has the uh, you know, power and ability and the bureaucracy, etc. But in this context, let me also say uh, something that might be uh, a maybe a transition, a little smooth transition. Turkey intends to have uh, uh, defense procurement and defense cooperation talks with uh, Italy and uh, France. Actually, this is on the table. There is a possibility that Turkey can work with these NATO allies, if not with US at the time. So that will make a, I think, smooth transition that Turkey's anchor, Turkey made it very public, but sometimes uh, the US and the, the European partners uh, have some doubts. Turkey's anchor is in NATO. Turkey's anchor is in the European uh, environment, security environment as well. I think this, if these talks start, and if uh, some sort of, uh, uh, some, some agreements, some projects uh, uh, are initiated, then I think U.S. position will be a little bit softer, I would say. I mean, that's how I, uh, I see it, and that is the expectation that we have. I want to add two things to what you said. If this deal doesn't go through, it will add to a long list of, uh, you know, episodes where Turkey is unable to purchase U.S. arms, advanced arms. Remember years ago, there was the armed drones that Turkey wanted from the U.S., uh, Reapers, uh, that didn't happen. Then, uh, you know, Turkey was interested in the Patriots, that didn't happen. Now, if 16s uh, which is kind of the backbone of Turkish Air Force, if that doesn't happen, like you said, it's going to be a big blow. Turkey will have to turn, uh, will have to turn to other providers and hopefully other NATO allies that it will be able to uh, find a deal there. But in terms of my second point is about NATO capabilities. Turkey is not just anchored in NATO. Turkey actually uh, contributes uh, it to, to regional security that other NATO con uh, members are very concerned about. Take Libya, for instance. Li NATO didn't know my, uh, what to do in, in Libya. Uh, it was Turkey's intervention that protected that UN uh, supported government in Tripoli and uh, Turkey, you know, there, there, there was a lot of Italian interests there. Um, 
and Italy is part of NATO. So Turkey not only is anchored in NATO, but it actually uh, contributes to NATO's overall security by, you know, uh, taking proactive roles in Libya, um, supporting, you know, Ukraine and Poland with armed sales. Uh, so these are major concerns for NATO's uh, regional security as well. So uh, these things uh, have to be remembered. But uh, as I mentioned, often it, for domestic political purposes, um, these things uh, kind of are forgotten. Uh, hopefully this time, this uh, new mechanism that was announced will uh, prevent uh, ahead of time such misunderstandings and breakdown in in relationship uh, in the relationship between two countries. Well, Kadir, thank you very much. I think with that we come to the end of uh, this session and uh, thank you very much for your uh, insights. Uh, I think next time we should also look at some uh, other areas of uh, relations between Turkey and US, more let's say uh, optimistic like commercial relationship, trade relationships, for example. I think these are also uh, they have also big potential that we need to talk. Thank you very much. And uh, from us uh, today, goodbye to everyone. Uh, have a nice time. Bye bye. Thank you.